starting to rain, so I'm gonna make this quick. I have a parasitic draw. I think this here's a 2009 F-150. I have this cool little meter that syncs up to my phone. It's, what is it, the Curian N2? Uh, the reason I'm using this is because it's wireless, so it hooks up to my phone. And while I am pulling fuses inside underneath the dash, I can have my phone set up and uh, I can see what's going on with the amperage. Now, if I pull this 10 amp fuse right here, I'm gonna show you what happens to the amperage reading. Notice it dropped down, I'll put it back in, maybe, maybe. All right, a couple of things to clear up before we move on. Number one, uh, most vehicles, we'll say the roll of thumb, the vehicle should be drawing under 50 milliamps. European cars are a little higher, older cars are a little lower. Generally, as long as you're around 50 milliamps, you're gonna be good as far as your parasitic draw. This thing was measuring 675, I believe, well above what's normal. That's number one. Number two, a better way of checking for parasitic draws instead of pulling fuses like you just seen is to measure the voltage drop across these fuses. And there's tools that can do it. Um, I actually don't have those tools. I've always just used a multimeter to measure the voltage drop across the fuse. If no current is flowing through the circuit, you won't have any voltage drop across the fuse. But if a circuit is alive and there is current flow, you're gonna have a very small amount of voltage drop. That way you can tell which circuit is active. The reason I didn't in this video, well, I, I was, you can see my multimeter laying there, but I'm right-handed and I can't really do much with my left hand, you know, um, and where that fuse box was, I was having a heck of a time getting my probes on the fuses. And by the time I got to the fuse that I had pulled out, uh, I had gotten tired of using my DVOM, but there are tools that make it a lot easier that I'm probably going to end up buying. The last thing I want to mention is that in the next section of this video, the wiring diagram I'm looking at is called a power distribution wiring diagram, where it shows all of the fuses in the entire vehicle and what they power up. So continue on. All right, so this goes to fuse 26. That fuse that I pulled is fuse 26. And it goes down to uh, front display interface module front controls interface module, instrument cluster, and key release actuator. All right. Now, there is a software update for, there's a software update for the sync. There's a TSB for it. But I think, I think the issue is with this cluster. So, so I disconnected the cluster and, uh, see what my meter reads we're down to like 10 milliamps so this was sent out this cluster was sent out to be rebuilt i don't know who did it but i'm pretty sure that is causing the draw um still a couple other things i gotta check though making sure this cluster isn't keeping something else awake potentially um but i think this cluster is bad so I wanted to make sure nothing else was causing this to turn on because, hold on, let me see, let me see. This here's the cluster. You can see that this cluster is on, but the key is not in the ignition. And I'm able to see live data. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is normal. I, I truly don't know if this is normal to be able to see live data. Uh, but I went through live data just to make sure that nothing was keeping this on and I don't see anything on. So I think I'm gonna call a cluster. Well, I'm back at this Ford and they got a new cluster and it didn't fix it. I made a bad call. Um, I'm back here. I'm hooked up to the high-speed CAN bus. I'm seeing that the high-speed CAN bus does not go to sleep and I think it's keeping the cluster awake and the cluster might be keeping other stuff awake. I'm still working my way through this. I'm going to let you guys know what I find. Well, 
When I went back to this shop, I think it was my third time there, I finally got the full story about this vehicle. This vehicle was at a Ford dealership to have a cluster installed or it had cluster failure. I don't know the full story about why it was at the dealership. What I do know is that Ford claims that they don't make this cluster anymore, so this cluster was sent to a rebuilder. The rebuilder either damaged the original cluster or couldn't fix the original cluster, so he sent an exchange unit in place. Once learning this information, uh, I started to think that maybe this cluster was coded wrong, right? Maybe this cluster for some reason was coded wrong. And I was talking to a couple of friends of mine, in particular, uh, a guy named Zach and a guy named Ollie. Might have been a couple other people in the chat, but those were the two I remember sitting here talking to the most. Both good guys located in Texas. We were talking about maybe this thing was coded wrong, um, keeping this awake. These vehicles, they have very uh, high failure rate shift interlock issues. Uh, when the shift interlock fails on these, it causes the cluster to stay awake. The problem is that shift interlock circuit that you see here on this green wire, it doesn't exist on this particular vehicle. I have a floor shift vehicle. This is an F-150 Platinum with the floor shifter. That circuit only uh, takes place when you have a column shifter, right? So in a column shifter, it sends out a signal through this green wire from the instrument cluster. And when the vehicle's in park, it allows us to have a path to ground, right? When it is out of park, we now have an open circuit and we no longer have a path to ground. In a floor shifter, that circuit does not exist. Um, the only thing that comes from the cluster is a power feed to light up the LED panel on the floor shifter. There's no signal to the cluster to put it to sleep. Now, how does that circuit actually work? I wrote 12 volts, it might have been five, but uh, you either have five or 12 volts going through a resistor inside of the cluster for the park sense circuit. When that shifter closes that path to ground, it's gonna pull that voltage down, right? We're all, we're, the cluster is measuring on the ground side of that circuit. So when the circuit is open, we have no path to ground, right? We have an open ground circuit. We're gonna measure 12 volts on the ground side. When that path to ground closes, it's gonna drop that voltage down to zero on the ground side of that resistor. And that's how the cluster knows if the vehicle's in park or not. So what I had to do was substitute or simulate that park sensor. Just ran a jumper wire to ground to simulate this. As soon as I did this, this vehicle went to sleep, All right? And that's when I called Isaac, all right? Isaac's a good friend of mine. He is amazing with programming, coding. Um, the big thing that I called Isaac for was I thought that this cluster was coded wrong. Um, the problem is on this particular day, the Ford coding servers were down. I could not pull as-built data from the server to compare it to uh, what was actually in this vehicle. And I thought maybe Isaac would have some type of cheat sheet or reference sheet to let me know what kind of coding should be in this vehicle. Unfortunately, he didn't. But while I was on the phone with him, what he did do was look at the part numbers that should be in this vehicle, something I didn't even think about. He found that the wrong cluster was in this vehicle. I'm gonna show you the difference here in this next uh, clip. So, this is the cluster that they're about to send back. This here's the one I diagnosed as bad. So this is supposed to go in a platinum vehicle, all right? This is not a platinum cluster. And I'm gonna show you guys why that makes such a huge, huge difference on this vehicle. This is the cluster that is supposed to be in here. Uh, so it's not necessarily that that cluster is bad. It's just the wrong one for the car. And again, once I get home, I'm gonna show you what tests I did last time I was here to prove that this cluster was bad. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed seeing me get my butt kicked. I didn't get as much footage as I would have liked on this vehicle. I, ah, the mobile life, it's, it's tough. It's definitely tough out there, but I hope you enjoyed it. 
I feel like I've been saying this the last few videos, but I'm hoping to film more. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Definitely need more of a mobile setup because my cell phone, cell phone alone, just it's not cutting it. It's not getting as much footage or as nice footage as I would like. But this is what I can provide for now. So hope you all like and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time.